I want to share with you two observations about my work in the theater. First, and most important, I have loved every single piece of art that I have brought to the stage. It's a requirement for me. Commercial potential is almost impossible to judge, and unless I believe in and feel the beauty and power of the work, I don't do it. Second, I have been committed to expanding the demographics of Broadway. Rent started that trend by attracting younger people to Broadway who before that had never thought there was anything in it for them. It was furthered by Avenue Q. And of course, Lin-Manuel Miranda's In the Heights replaced the shtetl of Fiddler on the Roof with the barrio and reached the Hispanic community who celebrated seeing characters who could be their family and friends up on that Broadway stage. And now with Hamilton, high school students describe the thrill of seeing American history played out by people who look and act a lot like them. Hamilton is not a show, former chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, Rocco Landisman, told me. Hamilton is a national trust. Everyone owns it, he said. Mr. Landsman was right. Hamilton has very quickly become part of the fabric of our American culture, our American dialogue. With a diverse cast that looks like America today, it is a story that can be possessed and embraced by all Americans, young and old, female and male, and people of all backgrounds and ethnicities. Indeed. Hamilton is our own uniquely American story. Of course, our most important initiative has been what we affectionately call EDUHAM, a national education program giving hundreds of thousands of high school students an opportunity to engage in an innovative curriculum about the founding era that starts in the classroom and culminates at a student performance of Hamilton. Here in Chicago, with the support of numerous generous donors, some of whom are here tonight and to whom I thank fervently for their passion for this program, we have played thus far to 19,850 public high school students. Chicago embodies the intersection of civic stewardship, cultural engagement, and capitalism that define American exceptionalism. The Herculean efforts of the business and civic leaders, the architects who dreamed up and built the Chicago World's Fair in, 1990, in 1893 exemplified how a city can enrich the lives of its citizens through entertainment, education, and illumination. What better place to launch a new exhibition that celebrates our American history, our values, and our impulses? I continue to be thrilled by the things we can make and build and support together. And then the first play you ever saw was on, on Broadway. Yes, Dreamgirls. No, and I love it. Wait, this is story is very important. This is an important story. Cousin? Uh, 17 years old. I was graduating from Oak Park High School. I'd never been to New York in my life. I dreamed about going to New York. So my cousins, Marty and Andrea Singer, that guy sitting to my right on the dais, who was um, uh, a research genius at Bell Labs, far smarter than me. So was she, right? They were both? They were both at Bell Labs. Um, they sent me a plane ticket to come to New York as my high school graduation gift. And um, on that um, Saturday in early July, uh, that's when Marty and Andrea brought me to Times Square for the first time and handed me my ticket to Dreamgirls. And that's where I saw uh, the first show I ever saw on Broadway. But this is good. It they was Dreamgirls, it was three, great. They could, not, <laughs> they could not afford three tickets. So they gave you one and you watched it by yourself? And you know what I learned? And it's good to learn this early in life, but if you haven't, I'm gonna give you a clue. It's okay and sometimes preferable to watch a play alone. <laughs> so you get to New York, you have a job where you make $200 a week. Yeah, my first job, $205 a week. And um, um, 
I lived at 121 Prospect Place, and I could take out $20 a week to live on after paying the rent and paying my student loans, right? There was that. And I couldn't afford a Hebrew national salami. And that was a loss. <laughs> and, it, you know, and it took me about two years but to finally get up in the- how did you live on $20 a week? Well, I mean, because, what you know- you, What did you eat? Well, what I would, you, you know what? I took my, I, I would take a peanut butter and jelly to sandwich to work and cut up carrots and celery and an apple. And you do not buy anything. But you know what I would do? I would save that $20 so that I could go uh, to TKTS and um, buy that ticket to go see whatever was the latest musical on Broadway. Wow. So that's how I got to see Big River. And that's how I got to see the mystery of Edwin Drood. They weren't the greatest shows in that era. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask but They were about pretty that. good. Um, what is it about you that could see the jewels there and what they could be? Well, here's the truth. I can't see how they're going to go over, but I can feel what they're doing inside of me. And I only go by how it feels to me. And um, if we go back to the beginning, when I met Jonathan Larson, it was, um, it was the fall of 1990. I was 25 years old. I'd broken up from my boyfriend of six years. I was in a job I did not like. And uh, a friend of mine said, hey, I'm going to see this rock monologue tonight. You want to go with me? Uh, it's called Boho Days. And uh, we went to this teeny tiny performance space, brick wall in the back, piano, band. Out comes uh, that beautiful, lanky guy that you saw for just a second on that video. And he starts singing what it's like to be a 29-year-old composer of rock musicals that nobody wants to see, that nobody will produce. What it's like to be wondering, should I still keep working at this diner that I don't like? Or should I go take this job at an advertising agency on Madison Avenue that will pay me a proper salary? Should I stay with my girlfriend with whom I'm safe, but who I know is not the love of my life? And he's asking all those questions on the precipice of his 30th year. And he's asking those questions in a musical vernacular that's making the hair on my arms stand up, that's, that's making me gush with tears because I'm going, how is this guy who I've never seen before in my life telling my story? And um, I wrote him a letter the next day because um, you know, I went to the party after, but I was shy. So I didn't really talk you to him that were much. Shy? I'm telling you, this is an act. <laughs> um, and I said to him, I, so I wrote a letter. I said, I want to produce your musicals. So help me God, the next part of this story is going to sound weird, but it's true. So two weeks later, I'm, uh, it's lunchtime at that job I said I don't like. And um, at uh, lunch, I'm eating my lunch at the desk. It is the carrots, the celery, the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and the apple. And, um, and I get called into the conference room by my boss. And uh, I go into the conference room, we sit down, and she says, you don't like this, this is not your job, and today is your last day, here's your check for two weeks, and you can pack up your things and leave. That's how they did it. And, uh, and, and then um, an all call came on that old fashioned intercom system, which was that if someone calls you at your desk and you're not there, then the receptionist just calls all over the office. <laughs> and I heard on the intercom, Jeffrey Jonathan Larson on line six. I went to drinks with Jonathan Larson the next day. And um, that was 1990 and rent opened in 1996. That's a great story. So do you view being fired as a favor? Yes, 100%. Did you become friends with her? You know what? Um, she still works in the business, and I hug her, and I thank her for what she taught me and for helping push me on my way. And Jonathan never really saw how successful Rent was. Jonathan died two hours after the final dress rehearsal of Rent at New York Theatre Workshop on January 25th, 1996. Did you feel like you owed him 
everything you had to make that successful because of I that. still feel like I owe him everything now. I'm sure he knows it. Yeah. You want an inclusive and accessible Broadway for yes. everyone. This yes. is very important to you. Why is this so important to you? Not just ticket prices, but you want the audience to be inclusive. You, Broadway is not known as being, known for being diverse. It yes. just isn't. And it has a long way to go to get there. So why is this your issue? You know, when we were doing Rent Off-Broadway, and I realized, standing in the back of the New York Theatre Workshop, that this is a show, this show is who I am. And I thought, if I can't do this show on Broadway, then I guess I'm not going to be able to work on Broadway, because this is me. And these are my people. And, and, and by that, I mean the lesbian couple, and the gay couple, and the Latina, and the young African American, and the straight couple. And if this- Why did you feel they were you, all of them? Why? Because why I guess I always felt like an outsider. Because I was a gay kid growing up in Detroit. And so then you want them to also experience, the, have the theater experience as well? So I want an inclusive society in which all of us get to participate. All of us get to play. I want to do a really quick speed round. We're so out of time, but okay. I just have to ask a few questions. Right. Your favorite Broadway play of all time? A chorus line. The most underrated Broadway play you ever saw? Underrated, like it's so much better than what people think. Maybe oh, it didn't make gosh. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Wild Party by Andrew Lippa, which I worked on. The most overrated Broadway play you ever saw. Forget it. Not on your life. You're not going Next. to say it. You've said everything else. Yeah. <laughs> How many times you've seen Hamilton? Oh my God. Well, if you say to yourself, I see it, I mean, I could see it four times in one week. I don't know, I've probably seen it a hundred times. Only a hundred. And, and now I will admit, sometimes I walk out and get a coffee and come back right in the middle of that too. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell Miguel. <laughs> if you could bring back a musical and revive it, have a revival, what would Yeah, you I've always said I won't do revivals. And then I did West Side Story. Um, because when someone like the author of West Side Story, Arthur Lawrence, says, will you do West Side Story, you say, yes, I would like to do West Side Story. Um, and you know what? That did it for me, because there is no better show than West Side Story. So you wouldn't do another one? No. And the Which best... means for sure I will, because, you know, we contradict ourselves. And after the tremendous, phenomenal, hard-to-even-quantify success that you've had, what do you hope for next? Do you know what I hope? I hope to walk into a little performance space with a brick wall and maybe just a piano and have that exact same feeling I felt when I saw Jonathan Larson do Boho Days in 1990. That's what I'm chasing.